Let's, uh, before we go to First Peter, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of coming out tonight. And it's a little rainy, and I thank you for the rain that we're getting. And I thank you for those who have turned aside. We have so many now that are under the weather, Father, and I want to pray for them. I want to pray that Linda's stomach condition heals up quickly and she'll feel well. Pray that Danny and Teresa got home safely and from their vacation time. I pray that it was an enjoyable and restful time for them. I want to pray for Clayton's back. We missed him and he and Kim this morning. Pray that you'd work there. And I know that some days it's really bad and rainy days, as we all know, are the worst. Pray for Norma. We miss her today and James. And pray that you would work in a mighty way in their lives and just push them. The Lord has pushed them into getting things done they need to, getting to the doctor and getting those things taken care of. I want to pray for Elizabeth and Clarence and their conditions and Mike with the leakage around that heart valve. Thank you that Dan is feeling better. Pray for Gary's travel as he comes home tomorrow. Thank you for the good news of Dana's friend there who's been attending church and I think she's seeking and I know that she'll find and Lord, I pray that you'd open the door for us to do a Bible study with her and help lead her down that road. And I lift up our entire prayer list to you tonight, Father, and I know you always answer perfectly. And I want to pray for all of our folks here tonight that you would be a just a, a mighty blessing in their life day in and day out as you always are. Tonight, Father, we be turning our attention now to 1 Peter. And I ask that the Holy Spirit would enlighten that word for us. And I pray that we would open our ears and eyes, our spiritual ears and eyes tonight to hear and see what you have for us. As always, your word is a direction to our life. It's a light into our path. And we need to take it to our heart. And I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit works in a mighty way with us tonight enabling us to really see those things that maybe we've missed before. So Father, you take charge of this hour and you guide us, you teach us, and you change our lives only for the better as we follow Jesus Christ day in and day out. And it is in his wonderful name we pray. Amen. I'm in 1 Peter chapter 2 tonight. We've been in 1 Peter for a while. We're not rushing. I'm in, I'm in no rush. We're in, on God's time and we're in God's Word. 1 Peter 2, beginning at verse 21, and in just a few verses here, Peter says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither God was found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but now are returning to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Oh, back into the shepherd. Takes us back to the morning message, doesn't it? Peter's telling us right here that the suffering that we might and probably will basically experience in our Christian life, it's going to happen. But even at that, when he talks about the suffering, he never gets too far without reminding us of Jesus Christ. Peter never, for that matter, gets too far away from Jesus. That's one of the things you notice if you read the Pauline epistles, if you read, read the Peter's or John, they never get far away from Jesus. There are a lot of things that they're trying to teach us, trying to show us, but it always comes back to the Lord. And Peter, like the other apostles, stays focused on Jesus. And this is the point of his letter. He reminds us, the believers of the suffering of Jesus Christ. You know, this letter was written nearly 2,000 years ago to believers. 
and we're still the believers today. It's like we're receiving this letter ourselves. It's amazing how God's Word, even though we look at it as past tense, it's present. It is just as much for us as it was the original readers. And Peter begins this particular section here by telling us, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither guile was found in his mouth. Leaving us an example. You know, Christians are followers of Christ. We have the example. When Jesus Christ walked on this earth, he suffered two distinct kinds of suffering. Two, two kinds. The first type of suffering that Jesus endured was as a human being down here when he became a man and suffered for righteousness sake. I think that sometimes we're guilty of forgetting that Jesus was totally man and he is totally God. I like to remind people of that so often. He was man. He was 100% like we are as far as in the flesh. Just had no sin. And we miss the fact that our Savior has knowledge of what we go through. He knows what it's like to live in these bodies. That's what makes Him such a great Savior. When we go to Him with our problems, He knows about them. You know, Jesus felt the same physical pain that any of us, any person on the face of the earth feels. Remember, Jesus knows how it feels because he felt those things which are common to us. Jesus knows what it's like to be hungry and thirsty and hot and cold and tired. And you can believe me, he felt the full pain of the lash. He felt the beatings. He felt the plucking out of his beard. He felt the nails going into his hands and feet. He felt that just as we would, and even more. So when we go to the Lord, He understands. We have a, a high priest in heaven who understands what we have here, what we go through here. Now, the second type of suffering that Jesus went through when He was on this earth was the suffering of the sins of the world. Now, I want to make sure you get this straight. Jesus did not leave us an example to follow concerning this type of suffering because he suffered for the sins of the world. That's not our example. Our example is to follow what he did in the body he, as he walked this earth and didn't revile back and didn't all those things that we like to do. There's no way that we can follow that suffering on the cross. The suffering Jesus did on the cross was for our redemption. The suffering of the Lord for our sins and our salvation is something that you accept by faith. And there's no way that we can imitate it. There's no way we can follow that. So when I speak of his example to us, for us to follow, the suffering of the sins of the world is not the example for us. But we need to clearly understand that in his life down here, Jesus left us a great example. There are many things the Bible does not tell us. I think I've mentioned over, the, I've got about a million questions I'd like to have answered when I get to heaven. But if the Bible is silent on certain things, there are things that we don't need to know. That's that simple. Maybe we're curious about it, would like to know, but God says it's not important for you to know right now. For example, we're not told anything about those 30 years, or abouts, that Jesus lived in Nazareth. About the only thing we know after the birth and going to Egypt and, is when he was in the temple, when he was a young youngster there. But if you read Psalm 69 closely, you'll find that the Messiah suffered ridicule and misunderstanding during those days. You see, the answer to some of your questions about what was going on, you just need to read other portions of Scripture. And you find out a little more. Just think about how people are. And let me say this. People today are not a whole lot different than people 2,000 years ago, except we're a little bit worse. Right? The, the, sin, the effect of sin has caused us to be worse. Worse physically, worse spiritually, worse with uh, diseases and that sort of thing, and, and it, with every generation. But we still have a great deal in common. You know, people like to gossip, people like to point fingers, people like to accuse. 
I'm going to tell you that was the same thing that you would have seen in Nazareth 2,000 years ago. You know, people like to gossip. And what they don't know, they just might simply make up. Gossip has a way of growing, doesn't it? As it moves along from person to person to person. With almost everybody that hears it, as they pass it up, they add something to it, so it just grows. It grows out of proportion. The story becomes completely opposite, maybe, of what really happened. So you can be sure that there are many people that remembered Mary returning from her trip to visit her cousin Elizabeth and she came back expecting a child. Don't think that there were those who didn't still think of her as an adulteress. They certainly pointed fingers and whispered as Jesus walked by. You know what his mother did? You know, okay. Don't you think that could happen? And Jesus lived a different type of life than his half-brothers and sisters <clears throat> because he had no sin nature. That would make him stand out, as we say down here in the South, like a sore thumb. He's different. He'd have been looked on as a very strange person. And you can be sure that those people were pointing fingers and there was a lot of whispering. and you know, They would have been difficult years for us, wouldn't they? Oh, boy, we wouldn't have liked it at all, but yet... Peter says Jesus did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Jesus didn't argue with those people. He didn't criticize those people. He didn't attack them. And what he did was he loved them. He loved the people who attacked him, accused him, you name it. Even on the cross, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. Jesus loved his enemies unconditionally. Well, we talk about an example to follow. There's one, isn't it? And it's not an easy example to follow. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you follow that example of Jesus? I don't want you to raise your hand because I know the answer. Sometimes, maybe. I can answer myself. Sadly, I, feel I fall short in doing that. I'm not always as forgiving as I should be. It takes me a while sometimes. You might think things would have gotten better for the Lord when he left Nazareth and went out to his public ministry. Well, but according to the Gospels, he suffered for righteousness sake. When we come to Jesus for salvation, you realize you begin a public ministry, so to speak. That's right. Now, I'm not saying that you become a missionary. You don't have to go to Africa. And I, you don't have to begin evangelistic crusades. You don't have to start a church, but you are beginning a public ministry. You know, we're to live a life that reflects our faith in Jesus Christ. And when we give out the gospel to the world, that is our public ministry. You know, if you look at Jesus' life, everything he did, he did publicly. He didn't hide anything. When he called people to follow him, he didn't call them, hey, come over here in the corner. He called them publicly. He did miracles. He did miracles publicly. And that's our job. Now, you're not likely to face physical danger in our country yet, but you're going to be verbally attacked. That's for sure. And watch out for the ridicule that will come when you fail to live up to the way you preach. If you don't practice what you preach, those fingers are going to start pointing. Oh, yes. you're. Oh, they say one thing, but they live another way. But when you, any type of suffering comes upon you for your faith, then you need to remember the example that Jesus left for you. Oh, my, that's it. Don't fight back. Forgive. You know, this includes some of the little things that we may not think of, such as wanting to get in the last word, wanting to attack back when somebody disagrees with you. These are, don't they? Some, you know, some people, if you let them, you'll be talking forever because they're always going to get the last word, right? Sometimes you just have to let them have it and go on. You have to follow the example of the Lord and you'll always live the way you should. You'll be a witness that's positive for the world to see. 
Your witness is your ministry. And keep in mind that one wrong word will damage your witness. One, one wrong word will chase even brothers and sisters in Christ away. It may damage a weak believer. Watch your words as well as your actions. So Peter says, no sin. Jesus did no sin, neither guy was found in his mouth. And this flows right into verse 23, will tell just who, speaking of Jesus, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Here's another example that Jesus left for us to follow. And again, this is a difficult, difficult road to hoe. Yeah, it's tough for us. Yeah, even though a believer is saved, we still have that old sin nature. There's a, if, if we could look spiritually within us, there's a war going on. A war between that new spirit and that old, that old sin nature, and it just battles. And sadly, the old sin nature wins a lot of times. You know, and when that sin nature rears its ugly head, and it does from time to time, it gives us a, that strong desire to strike back and to get even. Even for little things that you should just let bounce off your back. I feel sure that we've all had a problem, or at least from time to time, of wanting to avenge ourselves on those who attack us. Verbally, you know. And sometimes hard to, get, hard to forget. You ever thought about something that someone did to you 30, 40 years ago? And you start thinking about it, and you get angry? Why? Why can't we just let it go? But if you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, then you're a Christian. And Christian simply means a follower of Christ. Follow His example. Remember when you were a child, you most likely played a game, follow the leader. Remember that? When you played that game, you followed that leader wherever he went, whatever he did, you followed it. Christian, follow the leader's example and our leader is Jesus Christ. That just Ray elevated that child's game to it something important. Follow the leader of Je leading of Jesus Christ. And if you're truly a Christian, then you will allow Jesus, who is totally God and able to do all things, you will let Jesus allow the Father to settle your accounts. Hmm. That goes against what we've been taught. We've been taught to, to stand on our own two feet. We've been trying, we need to do this and do that. Well, let, let the Lord do it. That brings to mind what Paul wrote in Romans 12, 19. Dearly beloved, that's that tells us that Paul is talking to believers. So that means what? He's talking to you and me. Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, saith the Lord. So let me give you three little words to take with you tonight. When you have that strong desire for revenge, let it go. Hard to do, but let it go. I know that's easier said than done. But we have an instruction book, and instruction book is the Bible. Basic instructions before leaving earth. Your Bible. And it tells us what is right and what is wrong. We are to always do what is right. And no matter how hard we might, might be for us to, to try to let go of our anger, your desire to get even, or your desire to strike back, do things God's way. Let God handle it. And God's way is for you to let it go and allow Him to handle things for you. Let God be God. Why do we think that we can be God? Let God be God. Another problem we all have, we have a lack of patience. We do. Because we're impatient people, we have a tendency to want judgment to come on that person that hurts us. We want it to come on quickly. Lord, get them. It's almost like you tell your dog, sick. 
And that's what sickle. But that's not what we're supposed to be. We have a desire to see those who have attacked us get their comeuppance and right away, and we want it to be severe. Why is it that when somebody does a little something to us, we want them to be hit back harder? It makes no sense, does it? But you know what, Christians? That's not our job. We are not judges and we are not executioners. You only need to know that our great and mighty God will handle the situation in His own perfect time according to His own perfect purpose even though you may not ever see it happen in your lifetime. You know, we might think that that person, man, he hurt me and he got away clean. Patiently wait on the Lord. The Lord's going to take care of the situation for you. God's time is perfect. And so we leave it in the mighty hands of the Lord. Again, let me remind you, it's time for Christians to let God be God. By saying that, let me say, God does not need our advice. He doesn't need us to tell Him how to do anything, and He certainly doesn't need us to tell Him how long it's been since that person hurt us. God knows all things. We just need to trust Him. Simply trust the Lord because He always does what's right, always. So we're told Jesus, I'll suffer for the sins of the world there in verse 24, telling us, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Now the idea for us changes here because this is not the example that set before us to follow. We can't do that. Fact of the matter is simple. You and I cannot suffer any way, any shape, any form to wash away anyone's sins. You have to be perfect to do that, and it's not a perfect person walking the face of the earth. You know, we can't even suffer for our own sins, contrary to what some religious, false religions out there say, oh, you need to suffer. You have to do penance for your sins. You know, Jesus paid it all. We cannot save ourselves, so how can we save anyone else? See, this is not our example to follow. Once again, not mincing words, we're told that we, and that means you, me, all believers, being dead to sins. That was our condition before we came to Jesus Christ. We were dead. We were dead. And again, remember, it's Paul is right now writing to born-again believers. Therefore, he's writing to us. Keep that in mind. And before you and I came to Jesus Christ for salvation, spiritually, we were as dead as four o'clock. We were spiritually dead. That's worse than being physically dead. I'm going to tell you something. If the Lord had not been gracious to every one of us, He allowed us time to come to Jesus for salvation. If God wasn't gracious and He would have called us home in death, we would be eternally lost right this minute. But God is gracious. He gives time. If He would have called us, before, called us in death before we came to Jesus, we would have died in our sins. Being dead in sins is like going to the doctor and being told you have a disease and it's terminal and you're going to die if you can't find a cure for it. Well, there's no person on earth who can cure you, heal you completely of any physical disease. Only God. Only God. Doctor can prescribe something to help the symptoms, but God does the healing. You can only be healed by God and God's gracious mercy through Jesus Christ. And the same is, is true by being dead in your sins. You may have a way to be healed. You must have a way to be healed. And Peter gives us the prescription by whose stripes you were healed. I've noticed that when the so-called faith healers use this verse, by whose stripes you were healed, they refer back to Isaiah 53, 5, rather than this verse in 1 Peter. I know you might be thinking, what's the difference? It's a great difference, okay? Peter makes it abundantly clear that the healing he is talking about 
is the healing of sins. I agree without a doubt that Jesus Christ came to be the great healer. He is the great physician, but Jesus is a great healer of sins also. There has never been, nor will there ever be a human physician who can handle that problem, the problem of sin. You can't handle it. I can't handle it. If you were to call all the wise men of the world together, put them in a think tank, they still wouldn't be able to find a cure for the healing of sin. There's no other way than Jesus Christ. Now here's another important point that I want to bring up right here. Peter is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And the use of his words from Isaiah 53, 5 demonstrate that the prophet also had in mind not necessarily physical healing. He had in mind spiritual healing too. You see, the prophet Isaiah was talking about something far more important, something more profound. He was talking about the healing of sin. And we're told Jesus bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. The only cure for sin is Jesus Christ. And that's a fact. He bore our sins, our sins on the tree. He nailed those sins to the tree. Have you ever thought about the fact, what did Pilate do to the cross? He had his men nail the charges of Jesus to that cross. Jesus, King of the Jews. Jesus nailed our sins. Also, didn't he do that? He's taken him in his own body. Our sins are nailed to that cross. The same idea, they're nailed to that cross. For everyone to see. And we're all sinners. And since the Lord suffered for us to have salvation, we should live under righteousness. Believers live righteously. And of course, our righteousness is in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. There's none in us. All our righteousness are as filthy rags before the Lord. There's none righteous, no, not one. Now, let me drive home the point one more time. The only way we can be cured of sin is in Jesus by whose stripes we were healed. That's the only way. Now think about this. If you were spiritually dead before you came to Jesus, and we all were, then Jesus actually performs spiritual resurrections too, doesn't he? Before we're going to have a resurrected new body, we had a resurrected spiritual, spiritually, didn't we? You know, people talk about spiritual resurrections. That's it. We're going to be resurrected physically one day, but he brought us back from the dead spiritually the very moment we accepted him. And that's an amazing thing, isn't it? You know, Jesus took us from the shadow of eternal death into the marvelous and glorious light of heaven in one heartbeat. That's how quick it happens. At the moment of your salvation, Jesus Christ commanded the same thing of you that he did at the physical resurrection of Lazarus. Loose him and let him go. For Lazarus, he was talking about those grave clothes. He couldn't release himself. He was bound head to toe. Someone had to release him from those grave clothes. When you came to Jesus Christ for salvation, you were bound head to toe in grave clothes too, the grave clothes of sin, and you couldn't remove them. It took a command of the Lord. Loose him and let him go. For Lazarus, they loosed the grave clothes that he was wearing in the tomb. For the believer, he loosened all those sins that you've ever committed, ever will commit, and he gave you eternal life. You're washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. Now this healing, which is far beyond our puny comprehension, I guarantee. When you think about it, it is, it's mind-boggling. When you think about God's way of salvation, man would have never thought of this by the blood. Peter tells us what we are really like. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. You know, it's interesting that humans, both lost and saved, are called sheep. When you look at sheep, they're helpless, they're defenseless. 
And if they wander too far away from the flock, they can't even find their way back. Sheep need a shepherd. They need a shepherd to protect them. They need a shepherd to keep them from getting lost. They need a shepherd when they do get lost to go out and find them and bring them back. And Peter tells us, ye, remember, he's talking to believers. I want to keep reminding you that he's talking to you and me. We were a sheep going astray. Here we are. We are going a sheep. That's what we were. We were going, we couldn't find our way back. We were out there in the world and we were lost. And again, this is a quotation from Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And all means all. That's the way the shepherd has taken. Jesus Christ, the great shepherd, he has taken our iniquity. You know, mankind has a tendency, as I said, to follow the leader. Or should I say, follow the worldview. And if you're following the worldview, you are following the devil. It's humbling to know that we have all gone astray. But, and this is important, all of our iniquity, speaking, he's again reminding of the born again believer, all the iniquity has been laid on Jesus Christ. I always think about that when you talk about the books being opened. Can you imagine what the book of your life would look like? Oh, man. And some, of the, some of the young people understand what I'm saying here, but my, my life would be like the Encyclopedia Britannica. It would be a huge page after page after page. You get to the last page and it's just transferred to the account of Jesus Christ. All this. And then the next book would say, have your name and transfer the account of Jesus Christ to you. Righteousness. Salvation. Isn't it wonderful the way God works? But you know, we have to, we can't live by the world. You know, we Christians bind to the idea of the unbiblical ideas of the world, the ungodly ways, and they, they think it's just about human rights or individual freedoms. You know, but we do have the right to live any way we choose. That's true. You can live any way you want. But you need to also understand by living that way, you have a responsibility. You're responsible the way you live. You can live in a same-sex relationship. You can live in an adulterous relationship. You can murder unborn children. You can violate any biblical doctrine you desire. It's your choice, but take hold of this. You are also responsible for the choice you make, and you're also going to have to suffer the consequences for the choice you make. I'm not going to condemn you for whatever choice you make. That's not my job. My job is to tell you the truth of God's Word. And I cannot even make you believe it or accept it. I'm going to give you God's Word. It's up to you whether you follow it or not. But one day you're going to have to answer for your willful, chosen disobedience. We have turned everyone to his own way. See, that's the direction of the world. They go their own way. As I just pointed out, even believers can go their own way. They shouldn't, but sadly they can and they do go their own way. And there's only two ways you can go. That's all, just two ways. You can go God's way or your way. That's all. If I had to describe going his own way, I would call it the way of Cain. Either you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit or you carry the mark of Cain. I don't know how else to put it. Going your own way is the wrong way, the wrong direction. It has to be God's way. Going your own way is like getting on the interstate, going south in the northbound lane. You're going the wrong way, and it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. Even if you're a Christian and you can't find yourself going the wrong way, turn around. The words repent. That's what it means. Turn around. Go the other way. Go the Lord's way. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you this. 
our wonderful, glorious, mighty God allows U-turns. If He didn't, there wouldn't be one saved person on earth. There has to be a U-turn in your life. And Christians, sometimes we get off the path. We need to make that U-turn and come back too. As you see, the suffering of Christ is actually the theme of this portion of the chapter. Jesus suffered to give us, set an example for us. He suffered a vicarious, victorious, substitutionary death for our sins on that cross at Calvary. Now, there's one very important word before I close now. The word but. But. But are now returned. That's the same word that's often translated converted unto the shepherd and the bishop, the overseer of your souls. That word but is big because it connects the verse with the preceding ones. You were lost in sin. You were dead spiritually. You were going your own way. But there's the U-turn are now returned. That's a beautiful thought. And that one little word is so important. You made a U-turn. Rather than going your way, going astray, once saved, the believer now has returned to the Savior of his soul. I'm going to close with this. Believer, stay close to the Lord in all things. Follow His example. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for the time tonight and this message. And I pray that we can let it go. There are times when we forget about following the example of Jesus. We try to do things on our own. We try to get even. We get angry rather than turning it over to your powerful hands and let you take care of it, we try to do it ourselves. Lord, help us to let it go and help us to go your way and not our way. It's easy to go the way of the world. The road's pretty smooth when we follow that. And I know the, the road that we follow for you may not be so easy. And there's a lot of potholes for us. And yes, we're going to be attacked. But you are greater than any problem we have. And you are within us and you guide us. You love us. You direct us. and You've saved us. So help us, Father, to always remember we can make that U-turn and come back to you. And I pray that we would stay on the right path day in and day out following your example and being perfect witnesses as, much, as perfect as we can be anyway and our witness to the world. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for those who have turned out tonight. Pray the Holy Spirit is working in their heart in a mighty way. And I pray that you'd be with us to give us safety as we leave this evening and bring us back again the next appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being